After I became a member of Mot the Hoople, I rented a flat together with Mick Ralphs, and we got on really well. I had no idea at that time that Mick Ralphs was actually thinking of leaving the band, although it did seem strange that Paul Rogers kept coming over to our apartment. Finally, I found out that Mick and Paul were planning to form a band, which turned out to be bad company. So after about six months, during an American tour, Mick Ralphs left the band, and we had to get a new guitarist at a moment's notice, who turned out to be Luther Grosvenor, who we renamed Ariel Bender. Now, Ariel had been a hero of mine when he was in Spooky Tooth, who were an incredible band, so I was absolutely delighted when he joined Mont Opal. And after an initial strange period of discomfort, because he's a very unusual chap and, and very eccentric and quite in your face, but after a few weeks of that, I learned to absolutely love it, and we got on together like a house on fire. Sometimes on stage, he would come over to my grand piano and play a really outrageous guitar solo, and I'd light up a six-inch pink cigarette and blow smoke into his face. Going to America to tour with Mott the Hoople was a real eye-opener for a young lad like me, aged about 23, um, because I remember that some of the bands we toured with were extraordinary. Two that spring to mind, who played with us on numerous occasions, were the New York Dolls and Joe Walsh and Barnstorm. And I was totally amazed by these bands and watched them every single night. You know, before going to America in 1973, for me, American bands were like a bit of a fantasy. I mean, the big stars like Elvis and Little Richard and so on, they looked to me like kind of Hollywood caricatures. To me, they weren't real rock. You know, I'd grown up with the Beatles, Stones and Hendrix and so on. And for me, that was real rock. America was frankly a bit of a joke. However, once I got to America and saw what it was like with its Cadillacs and Coca-Cola and hamburgers and beehive hairdos and diners, I understood why American bands play like they do, and I really learned to love it. And my first concert with Mott the Hoople in America was at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago, where our opening band was Joe Walsh and Barnstorm, who I think was at the peak of his career. And backstage, we said to Joe Walsh, you know, Joe, we're staying in the same hotel as you tonight. And he said, hey, man, that's kind of dangerous. Joe Walsh at the time was looking incredibly scruffy. And Ian, for the tour, had just bought a really expensive patchwork leather jacket. And with great generosity, he handed the jacket to Joe and said, why don't you wear this for the rest of the tour? And he did. Now, of course, in the early 70s in America, there were a huge amount of drugs to be had, and we were always offered all sorts of things with strange names like XPHT or PMQRX, and we had no idea what they were talking about, and frankly, we didn't want to know because we were a drinking band. Now, if I can describe a typical touring day in America, we'd wake up about 7 or 8 in the morning that early because we had to get a plane to the next gig and inevitably we'd had a party the night before in our hotel room so had only had about three or four hours sleep and were pretty much the worst for wear in fact most days i would get up saying i'm never going to drink again and then we get on the plane and a charming air hostess would say would you care for a cocktail sir and i'd say well bloody mary would go down rather well so i'd have two or three of those on the flight and we get to the next town check into the hotel and we'd say well what time's the sound check and they'd say, five o'clock. And we'd say, five o'clock? What are we going to do until then? And so most days what we do is get the yellow pages out and look for the local thrift shops, or what we call charity shops. And we'd all go out looking for cheap instruments, well, mainly guitars, because guitars were incredibly cheap in those days. And so over end of Mick bought the most amazing bargains, Les Pauls, Stratocasters, Telecasters, what have you, for ridiculous prices. Keyboards were not so easy to buy because they're usually too bulky to take back to England. However, I used to buy massive amounts of incredibly strange and rare albums for about 25 cents each. And usually towards the end of a tour, I'd have to buy a trunk to put them all in to take them home. So clutching our newly bought treasures, we go back to the hotel and gloat over them and sit by the pool and have cocktails until we were called to go to the sound check. Between the sound check and the gig, I'd usually put away a bottle of wine or so then take another bottle of wine on stage with me. Actually, for a while, I had a champagne bucket on top of my piano, full of ice with a bottle of champagne. The problem with that was, because of the bubbles in the champagne, every time I went to sing backing vocals, I found myself burping instead. So the champagne went, and I changed to white wine. And then it was the after-gig party. We had a kind of rotor system where we'd say, right, 
Tonight it's your turn. The party's in your room. I remember once when we were touring with Aerosmith, we locked Steve Tyler in the party room and left him on his own. He had to get out the window, climb across the balcony to the next room, and escape that way. So, okay, it sounds like it was all fun and games from start to finish, but, you know, there were some darker moments. I mean, being on an American tour for three months, a long, long way from home, it felt like in those days, was a pretty disorienting experience. You know, you're in a different city every day, in a different hotel every day. Sometimes you don't even realize you're in a different hotel every day, because if you're staying in, say, Holiday Inns or Hilton's every night, the decor of the rooms is exactly the same. Even the painting above your bed is the same. And if you get a call from someone saying, Hi, where are you now, Morgan? I'd have to look at the telephone or the hotel ticket to see which town I was in. And perhaps more than the other guys in the band, I thought drinking would help this. It probably made it worse. There was one thing, or should I say one person, that made it a whole lot better, though. We had a wardrobe man on that tour called Lee Black Childers. That's Lee with three E's. Now, Lee was a photographer, but much more than that. He'd seen a lot of life. He'd hung out with the Andy Warhol crowd and knew all kinds of amazing creative people. He was as solid as a rock. He was so reliable. After each concert, he would take our clothes to the cleaners and then get up five or six in the morning and go and pick them up. He was like the rock on which our daily life was built. Totally reliable, always there with a smile and taking photos of everything that went on. He must have the most incredible collection, and I hope he puts them in a book one day. I was delighted to see him recently in a film about Arthur Killer Kane, the late bass player of the New York Dolls. He looked great, and if he sees this, Lee, thank you so much for everything you did for us. You're a diamond. One time when we were in New York, we went to the CBS building, which is a huge, forbidding black monolith. And they were very nice to us. They opened their cupboards of albums and gave us as many as we wanted. And we staggered out of there with huge piles of records. When we got back to the legendary Gramercy Park Hotel, Ariel Bender got out of the limousine with his stack of records and shouted out, Free records! Anybody want one? And windows opened all around us and guys were shouting, Hey, hang on! Keep one for me! That's the kind of guy Ariel was. Often after a gig, the dressing room would look like a flea market. Someone would say to him, love that shirt you're wearing, and in a second he'd take it off and say, it's yours, and he'd trade it for something. So by the time he got back to the hotel, he'd be wearing different clothes than what he came out in. I think for me the best number we played on stage was a fairly obscure track from the All The Young Dudes album called Sucker. Now, on the album, it has a fairly weak production by David Bowie, which leaves a bit to be desired. But when we played it on stage, it grew into a monstrous rock epic that sounded like a herd of elephants or Godzillas stampeding through the town. Then, of course, there was all the young dudes. Nearly every time we played it, the entire audience would sing along, waving their arms in the air like at a football match. It sounds silly, but sometimes it was all I could do to keep from crying. So, looking back, as well as a kind of golden age of rock and roll, I think it was also a golden age of America. Without wanting to put America down, in those days, it was a very positive, exciting, thrilling place to be. And it was the days before AIDS, so there was less heaviness in the air and much more fun to be had. It was like a young man's dream to see all these historic places and to meet all these incredible musicians. So... I'm very, very grateful for the experience, and I'd like to thank the band and everyone that worked with us and for us. And I hope my little 8mm film gives a taste of how it was. Thanks. <laughs>